At first, it's all about survival. Then, your business is thriving. What's next? Entrepreneurs and CFOs debate, do we grow or do we go? On the next Language of Business. This is the Language of Business with Greg Stoller. Let's face it, dealing with your baby or the company you started from scratch is a lot different than advising someone else. The savviest of entrepreneurs at some point are supposed to bring in professional management, or basically people who not only know what they're doing, but more importantly, can also be objective. John Lieber is indeed one of those professional people. He's a CFO who has extensive experience with startups. And John, welcome to Language of Business. Thank you for having me. John, so many people spend so much time trying to focus on the market that they're competing in. How do you size markets? Do you do it in-house? Do you rely on outside services or a combination of the two? The answer is it depends, but really a little bit of both. I think in general, one of the values that any management team brings to a situation is its understanding of the market and the product or service that it's developing and selling at the end of the day. And so I think what's important there is having having a feeling and a view of what that market is and how it's growing and what the factors are that impact that growth. However, there are times, for example, where you need to go out and buy data from a third party or you might need to go out and get some consulting help because it's just an area that's, that's just not very well defined. And so in those cases, you would actually use a combination of different things of those two methodologies to size the market. So for example, in the case of an industry that's close to my heart, the biopharmaceutical sector, if you were developing a new drug to treat asthma, that market is pretty well known. You can go buy data, for example, and it will tell you how many asthma patients there are in the North American market, the European market, et cetera. However, if you were trying to develop a drug for an orphan disease for where there are, there's no other marketed drugs right now, there you might need to go out and hire somebody, hire some expertise, perhaps bring somebody in-house who's used to working in spaces like that. So once you've sized the market, now you're going to focus on market share. To what extent do you look at your own company versus external trends, or are you really focused on moving your own needle from one side to the other? It only matters depending upon what other things are. So the factors that really feed into whether I care about it or not is a few things. Number one, how big is the market? Number two, how quickly is it growing? And number three, how profitable is the product or service that you are selling? So for example, if you could, you could have a really low market share, but of a huge market that's growing very rapidly, and that could be great if your product or service is also very profitable. You could have a much greater market share. For example, say it's only a $100 million market. Maybe it's a little bit slower growth, but if you've got 60% share and a pretty profitable product, you could also be very happy. So it really depends upon the dynamics, those, the dynamics of those three things that we just talked about. Let's move on to profitability. You're doing well, you're in growth mode. How do you as the CFO determine when to reinvest those profits, distribute them to your shareholders, or actually start looking for follow-on products? There are three different ways that I kind of think about it. I think most sort of investors, board members think about it, management teams. Number one, where are you going to earn the greatest return? And that's really the, mo the most important piece. So do you keep investing in your primary product, your first product, for example? because you think that there's a lot more growth ahead of it. Maybe there's a line extension you can do that can extend or prolong the lifetime, the life cycle of that product. Um, secondly, you would want to compare that to a new product development and the risk of developing a new product and what the returns are there and how that actually ho hopefully feeds into your overall business. And then lastly, I think at the end of the day, if you don't have a good opportunity to reinvest money into the business, then the right thing to do is to give it back to the shareholders because they might be able to earn a greater return than than you. Who ultimately has responsibility for this? Is it your job as CFO to finally make the tough decision? Is it a joint decision with your CEO? Or what is your personal experience indicated? That's a good question. I think at the end of the day, it's management's job to go ahead and figure out what the right thing to do with the money is, and then how to invest it, and then ultimately make a recommendation to the board. And the board will then decide if they agree or disagree. Usually, if management makes a compelling recommendation, they'll agree. Have you ever had veto rights over the board? No, I have not. Would you want to? Uh, I don't think so. In typical governance, I think the board really should be the final say um, if you want to have good, appropriate governance for a company. Let's look at now, John, at a product portfolio. How do you deal with your biggest contributor to profitability? Do you marshal all of your resources supporting it? Do you ride it until it's essentially dead? Or do you proactively start changing some of those resources to smaller, less successful products? I think it's very important to make sure that you transfer some of those resources or at least balance how the resources are shared amongst the products in your portfolio. Because ultimately the question that every investor is going to ask and every management team has to ask before the investor asks it is, so what does the next five years look like? How does 10 years outlook? And if you can't answer your question as to how you're going to grow your business or improve profitability 
off of that main product, then you really do need to be investing in alternative products. But the flip side of that is, in your experience, have you ever seen a company be in too, mar too many markets concurrently? Actually, there was a company that I joined that was a small company, and it was trying to do too many things at the same time. Now, I will say that larger companies with deeper organizations and a lot more systems and processes in place probably can support lots of different businesses. We see lots of companies out there that do that. For smaller companies, I think that's a much harder thing to do. It's a much greater challenge. And you can run the risk of creating confusion amongst your employees, which we had actually at this company, confusion in the marketplace, which we also had. And sometimes you can even have a lack of, of you know, your quality can suffer in the product or the service that you're offering. So it is important, I think, as, especially as a small company, to stay focused, but to know when you need to start investing in those follow-on products. What does your gut instinct tell you about when it's time to sell? There aren't really any hard and fast rules when it's time to sell. It's really governed by a few different factors. The first could be, for example, do I need to build something in the company that somebody else already has? So for example, let's say I need to build a global sales force and a global field service team to service some equipment that I've sold. If there's other companies out there that already have that, it might make sense actually to go ahead and sell to them so that I don't actually have to go through the investment and the, and the trouble and the time and the risk of building those things out. So there, it, that's one way to think about it. Another way to think about it is maybe the investors actually need the capital back. For example, if you have a venture investor who's been in, the, in a company in an investment for many years, all of a sudden the IRR starts working against them, the time value of money is working against them, and they may need to get money back for other reasons, for example. As the CFO, how do you yourself define success? I think success at the end of the day is building a successful company that delivers returns to shareholders that are commensurate with the risk that they took. So for example, in a venture investment, you would think investors would want to see returns in the you know, 20 plus percent, 30 percent range basically. If it's a publicly traded stock, you know, maybe a 10 to 15 percent return per year might be, a, might be a good thing. And so at the end of the day, it really does depend upon um, on what the, how much risk and how much time uh, went into that investment, basically. So, but I do think ultimately the way you do that is by building a company that's built to last, that has products that are successfully developed, and ultimately where you're executing on the plan that you created. Thanks, John. John Lieber, a CFO with extensive experience working with startups. Would you decide to sell your company? Greg Stoller talks with Farkhan Nazari next.